Grace Falls itself. Yeah, prefer to challenge myself. Uh, that's a tough one. Can I ask answer that question? Wow, we, 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 we. The Filipinos love to win at chips. The Indians love to win at chips. Mexicans love to win at chips. You have to pick this in perfection. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yes. We, we have the same to have chips before. Hey guys, welcome to another beautiful episode of The Billionaire Habits with Dr. Stephen Akita as a podcast and I'm having a lot of great guests and this is the Bot Khalifa Dubai episodes and today I have, of course, Mr. Tim Olatoke, the uh, co-founder of All Africa Festival as well as the CEO of Ojemia. How are you today? I'm doing fine. I do. The, the one and only husband <laughs> to Nina. <laughs> How's Nina and the kids? Oh, they're doing fine. They're doing fine. My first question is, why entrepreneurship for you? Because sometimes I wonder that like, this man is... <laughs> I mean, it's almost as if entrepreneurship has beaten you back black and blue. <laughs> so why entrepreneurship? I don't know how to answer that question. I think I organically just grew into it. Uh, my previous lives, I'd worked as a different, uh, I've worked different helmets or different parts, just so to say. Various corporate organizations where I go in there, consult, deliver programs, projects, transformation projects from the uh, technological side of things and very quickly so I, were you a programmer or it special what was your background profession i started with dbase 4 programming that was way back in 1996 97 and then gradually i moved into the nt world which is windows and uh, i naturally gravitated towards uh, voice over ip as all the systems and solutions were beginning to converge into unified communications meaning everything being on iphone well not iphones I, uh, you know ip phones and the rest of it so i got very interested in that and naturally that led me into cisco so i became a serious cisco guru because i bought a lot of gears in my house they were my toys they were like my ps4s and ps5s back then and I used to try and configure a lot of things back home before I go back to the office. And Networking, I, internet networking. Yes, internet and, networking and all the streaming and all of yeah. that. Gradually started moving away from being a fields or help desk engineer to doing more of rolling out programs and projects uh, from the technical side and gradually became uh, more business focused. So I became the interface that was talking to the business and also talking to the IT guys. And there was a big gap back then because a lot of program managers at the time or project managers at the time only knew gun charts and the rest of it. All they want to get is things done. They didn't understand exactly how the technical guys were getting it done. And the technical guys were always at war with business requesting for more money for more things and more gears and all of that. So I gradually moved into that space where I could understand from a business perspective, what was being expected for the return on investment. And from the IT side, I could understand why an engineer is frustrated to go to a site four times to do, to upgrade a certain switch. Why can't he do it at once and not factoring the cost into the game. So gradually I started doing a lot of uh, uh, training on the business side of things in order to understand. But this time around, you were working for a company. Uh, no. So over the years, I'd worked for mm, a lot of telco companies because those were the ones that were really pushing this agenda forward back then. And I was a contractor, so I contracted for O2 Telefonica for close to maybe about four and a half years off and on. I did uh, in the UK. I also did one. That was about uh, 2014, 2013, 2014. That's when I moved into Dubai. Wow, that's strong. Yeah, it's been a while. So what, what, why Dubai? 
Uh, at the time, there were various options on the table. I had Dubai, I had Abuja, and I also had the UK. I just returned back from uh, Ramallah, where I did about 20, no, about 28 months in Ramallah. Initially, I went there as in the West Bank, Gaza. Uh, I did set up a telecoms company. I was number eight uh, employee to set up the second telco provider. At the time, it was called Watania Mobile, which is now Oredo. Uh, it was a Qatar-backed uh, project, and it was a successful one. I mean, when I joined the company, I was number eight, and by the time I was leaving, we're over 1,400. Uh, my department had grown up to about 800 staff because uh, for the first time, I was working fully on the business side and not on the technical side as the technical consultants to the COO. So I was working directly with the CFO, the COO, and the CTO, uh, making sure all customer services, operations, and equipments were in line with expectations that the CTO was delivering. So it was more of a, uh, an enterprise design role, really. And looking at how everything was going to interconnect and everything so was going to work by? So by the time I finished that project, I went back to the UK. I think I got another contract with uh, Kibble and Wireless Worldwide. We're doing some uh, uh, AXA, yeah, AXA program integration. That was a big role back then. And uh, it was a big role with no benefits. <laughs> <laughs> so I attended a lot of big meetings with board CEOs and all of that. And still yet, I go back and my team was literally four people. Whereas when I left Ramallah, my team, my personal team was about nine people. So there was a lot of uh, benefits in the, uh, in the Middle East. Uh, with so you felt, let me just go back. Yeah, to so I was, I was looking for an option. I was looking for a, a place out to have something nice in the Middle East and, uh, my wife got a an offer here in Dubai. Uh, at the time, I think I had just set up in Abuja. I was trying to see what I could do there with a lot of the technologies and applications I'd built from scratch to try and see I could get my penetration and start doing something back home. I think I woke up one morning and I said, hey, why not Dubai? Let me give it a try. So I set Since up a your base. your wife yeah? got something. Yeah, so I set up a... I set up my first company here in 2014 and uh, I was using it to do a lot of transactions between the UK and moving things uh, from Europe to Nigeria. That's logistics. Uh, no, in the power sector, I was doing a lot of projects for NDPHC uh, back in Nigeria when I moved to Nigeria. So I was selling softwares as, selling, as well as managing uh, power, power installations. So I was doing all of that. Uh, it was a bit of a struggle. It was I always like challenges, and uh, I kept pushing that. But after a while, you realize um, if Nigeria is for you or not for you, <laughs> uh, because I go through a lot of uh, challenges trying to get things into the country, and then uh, it's a different challenge. I think I had more resistance going to do the installations than to do than importing the right equipment. It was all. Fair and good. And as things began to evolve, I realized that there were a lot of opportunities here in Dubai. Opportunities whereby the way I, I'll call them greenfields, the market wasn't developed. And there were a lot of uh, first mover advantage, if you could muscle up and go get through the entire time of uh, building the market and constellating the market and. Uh, growing the market it's like a farm it takes a while for everything to come together employment versus employee which one will you pick uh that's a tough one oh versus employer because you've been in both worlds yes i have been in both worlds and quite honestly it all depends on the individual and depends on where you see yourself when you decide to retire or semi-retire as they call it Personally, I think I prefer being the employer. I prefer being the person that takes the chances, that takes the gamble, 
because it's not everything that you do that is successful. Some of them you'll crash and burn, but the way I see it, it's all builds up to your final goal. So with all you've been through, because you've been through a lot, you still will prefer to stick to be an employer. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yes. The, the hesitation is so easy to... No, 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 because... It, it, uh, because why, why I love that I'm asking you this is because you have worked as an employee at the highest level. So it's not, you know, some people easily want to become an employer because they've not worked in senior roles where the pecs, the, I mean, it's, you are not bothering your head. The, what you are earning is enough to make you good, you know. But now when you now, because it's almost sometimes like a demotion where you leave a very high role and to now become an employer and you guess it's difficult now you're not sure of your own income you're not sure of your your employee's income everything is just nothing is guaranteed absolutely but uh, <laughs> so that I, between husband and wife will you advise both of them become employers no but it all depends on the mindset and what makes them happy and uh, and uh, fulfilled that's the word to use fulfilled so there are people that are fulfilled by doing regular things every day, your routine procedures, and there are some people that get very easily bored mm -hmm. and they, they want creatives. to try out. Yeah, exactly. They want to try out new things, new adventures, try out new concepts. And I think I fall into the latter category. I prefer to challenge myself to keep my brain thinking and not just to be repeating things. Oh, Jamia, why? Why did you start Jamia? It's a marketplace. Yes, absolutely. So why why did you start? When did you start Ojemia? So the concept of Ojemia, I or should I call it the yeah the idea of Ojemia actually started way back when I was in the UK. This was in 20, 2004. I scripted it and I'm like I didn't call it Ojemia back then, but I was like wow I liked what we're doing with PayPal and eBay. I wanted to create something, and I started looking at doing something. I believed I built did, a did sketch you, out. Did you code it yourself? Yes. Uh, it was my test experiment. Each time I, I, I see something I like to do, I try to create a project in my head and then walk that project through while I'm training myself how to code or whatever I'm doing. So I did it back then, but I quickly canned the idea because obviously I had other uh, I had a full-time consulting role mm. to, to to deal with, so I didn't have the time to be able to build out the idea. It was just something that was sitting down on a computer. Uh, and I put it into, I have a playbook, by the way, uh, when I have ideas and these things come into me, I just write things down and I keep it in my playbook. So that was way back in 2004. And uh, 2016, when I decided to stop my, or, put on hold my NDPHC uh, contracts in Nigeria uh, and I came back into Dubai because I was frustrated at the rates which the dollar was uh, and the Naira was plummeting and the dollar was appreciating because 80% of what I was doing or I would say 90% of what I was doing was I was purchasing things exactly imported and I was being paid in Naira. So even by the time you complete a full cycle of a contract, which takes anywhere between three to eight months. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in you, loss. Exactly. So I was like, okay, so what do I do now? Uh, I came back to Dubai. Uh, my parents, as my parents, my kids and my wife were already based here. I was busy coming in and out as I was traveling by. So I was like, okay, what do I do? So I go back into my playbook, look at all the different applications and different tools, business tools I had. I also looked at the market. I tried to get employment or get contracts like I used to do in the UK with Cisco. I tried with Oracle, quite a number of them, but it wasn't clicking. It wasn't just, I felt that no, I could do more. So I decided, you know what? What can I actually do that would have a lot of impact? I will have a lot of joy in doing it and also be able to build a base where I can get a lot of data and as well as uh, get to know the markets. 
something that was going to be recession proof. So that ticked off a lot of, uh, uh, I crossed out a lot of softwares that I had, like the HR software, payroll softwares, you know, CRM softwares, because I'm thinking to myself, okay, this is 2017, I'll turn it 16. I'm like, okay, uh, what if a recession comes? What is it that is going to be definitely recession proof? That regardless of whatever is going on, I'm like, you know what? Food. FMCG. People would always eat. People would always have to buy sanitary products and all the rest of it. They will always have to get through their daily lives. So uh, why not build something in that space? And then when you look at the industry, you realize, okay, there are a lot of big players already playing in most of these avenues. You go in there, is that you have... Uh, an incredibly niche area to go into or you have crazy amounts of billions to pump in there to be a challenger so I chose the first option which was you know there's no point reinventing the wheel let me go into spaces whereby I sell upscale products products that you cannot get in your regular grocery shops and uh, give a voice to those products by the way Jamia means Oja in Af is a Nigerian Yoruba language, yes, which Oja means is market. market. Yep. Mia is Middle East and Asia. Correct. Mm-hmm. So uh, I decided to con the word that Middle was probably... Middle East Africa. No, Asia. Middle East Asia. Asia, okay. because the whole idea... Oja already covers Africa. Yes. And there were so many aspects to this and so many categories or business lines I could chase up. Uh, at the moment, we're still, I would say we're still in the baby phases because there's a lot of trade happening. When did you finally start? And- so the name of Jamia was actually coined in 2018. I registered it finally in 2020. No, sorry, 2019 I registered. And uh, end of 2019, we did our friendly user testing got on friends and family they started buying from the platform and then by 2020 we went commercially live in january which was woo after three years of planning three years of mapping out a strategy go to market strategy okay what we're going to do how many vehicles we're going to have how many employees we're going to hire how many product clients we're going to deal with first and categories and how we're going to scale up and it didn't work out like that um, February comes. So I'll give you a typical example. When we started off, we started off with our uh, mostly long shelf life products. Uh, that was to help us develop and understand our distribution uh, supply chain lines and last mile delivery to our customers. We made that decision intentionally because we didn't want to uh, play with goods uh, that such would as then perish. yeah, perishable goods, highly perishable goods such as the meats, the fish, and the rest of it because uh, it needed more investment in getting vehicles that were reg- refrigerated and all the rest of them. Come February, uh, the lockdown came in. And then all and that our... that was good news, by the way. Oh, yeah. Uh, for uh, e-commerce. Yeah. And all our customers started, or all the small uh, amount of customers we had gained, which was about 200 or 300 customers within the first month or two, that we had gained at that point in time, started demanding for, oh, we want vegetables, we want this, we want that, we want water. We're like, hey, we didn't plan to sell water. <laughs> we want, you know, we want uh, uh, floor brushes, bleach, this, that. We're like, wow, wait, 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 wait. So when the customer calls and say, oh, we've just checked your website, you don't have this, is there any chance? Is there any chance you can buy us a uh, do credit? We want to top up our phones. We're like, wow. <laughs> and then the sales spiked spike so high we couldn't keep up with the demand and by month four we start having another challenge hit us we start having loads of cancelled orders or returned orders because we're running out of goods a lot of our warehouses were running out a lot of our suppliers were running out of materials because all the parts of africa was closed transactions were you processing at the time day during the lockdown, we're doing quite a lot. We're doing an average of about, I'll say maybe 30 to 50 a day. 
that we're doing at the time. Uh, it depends on, you know, the time of the month, whether people are just getting paid and all of that. Um, so, so in a week, you were doing over 300? Thereabouts at the time. We're, we're struggling to deliver. We're, we're, I mean, although at the time, and also the market space at the time was when we launched, we're doing an average of two to three days delivery timeline. Uh, with COVID came the rise, uh, the popularity of Deliveroo, Talabat, Zomato, and the rest of them. And people were now used to getting their items in 30 minutes. So all the vehicles that we had invested in, we had to cut down on that and change direction and start going the bike route because it was cheaper to run a bike, easier to park a bike, easier to uh, fill up the tank of the bike was less than 20 dirhams. To fill up a car was about 120 dirhams at the time. So it was a lot easier and people's shopping baskets were now reducing. They weren't buying the large things anymore and they were just buying items when they needed it. So the customer behavior was changing and we had to constantly be in in touch with our customers to understand their shopping patterns, the frequency of shopping, understanding how well we could satisfy them because without them, we couldn't exist. Basically, they are our bosses. And if we don't listen to the markets, then we'll be out of business. Has that pattern improved or reduced now? Uh, funny enough, it's ever changing. The markets, uh, uh, there are so many moving parts to the equation. So it all depends. And every time we take a snapshot of our sales week to week, month to month, year to year to see, okay, this time this year, last year, how well were we doing? Uh, we, it hasn't been consistent. And we most times need to look at the key market indicators to look at what's going on around that time. So take, for instance, right now, the football is going on, the FIFA World Cup. A few other things are happening, so definitely people are a bit distracted. And uh, the market is not like it was this time last year. And so we have our uh, challenges. So the market is something that is constantly evolving. And in order to stay alive and survive the business world, you have to evolve, you have, you have to evolve with it. Oh, wow. So All African Festival, how did that start? So the All Africa Festival in its current form started in 2021. But prior to that, there was a smaller festival we were doing, which was our proof of concept. At the time, it was called the African Food Festival. And the African that Food... That started when? 2018. We did the first African Food Festival. Uh, so you had done like four episodes? Two. We did two episodes. 2018 and 2019. 2019. Yes. Then 2020, because of the COVID. The COVID. Then 2021, you changed the, the pattern. We changed the pattern. We changed the strategy. We The, the reason why we went with food at the time was uh, we were trying to see whether there was a desire, whether there was a market for it, and if people were going to be interested in it. If we called it a fashion festival or a music festival, we won't be able to capture the crowd as much as we would have done with a food festival because everyone eats, everyone likes food. So if you say, hey, come check out this food festival, there are different types of food from different parts of Africa. Everyone turns up and say, hey, let's see what's going on. So that's how we started the concept as a food festival. And very quickly, we realized that the market was huge and had so much potential. We also realized that there were other parts of uh, the market space that wasn't being catered for. Uh, such as some of the feedback we got from the attendees of the food festival that said, oh, uh, we've come here yeah. and uh, we're of African heritage. We're from the Caribbeans or we're from Trinidad or we're from the UK or from the US. I was born there. I don't know anything about Africa, but my great grandparents, I'm African by, you know, descent, but I don't see my story being told here. I see a lot of stories, but I can't connect. And we're like, okay, that's interesting. Uh, okay, let's know more about your stories. And you know, we started having conversations with different parts of the of the of the of the market space, even including there's a huge African Arab population and stories that is never been told. Yeah, 
I know. No real call. Oman. Oman has a lot of Tanzanians. Yes. Saudi has a lot of Sudanese, has a lot of Somalians, has a lot of, that have migrated there for the last two, three hundred, four hundred years. They're mm. full Saudis. Yeah, a full Omanese, even Emiratis. There are a lot of Emiratis that have uh, uh, Tanzanian and uh, Ugandan heritage. Through that experience, we said, okay, we needed like a community advisory board, which we set up that we try to make sure we had a representation of every part of Africa, not just Africa, the map, but Africa, a people, as we say. So we have people from Brazil, Brazil, uh, Cuba, Cuba has a lot of Venezuelans, but you know, in Cuba, Cuba has uh, one of the highest Yoruba population. Uh, they, they are the only country that has Christianity and Yoruba deities matched together in their forms of worship. So if you take the Queen Mary and turn it around, it's someone, I uh, say Queen Mary, the uh, Mary, mother of Jesus. It's a Yoruba deity that is there. They have Shango, they have everything. Yeah, <clears throat> and they have all of that. So, uh, when we look at it, and they still worship uh, Ifa there, the Oni of Ife is still their king, he still visits there. So we begin to see a lot of things coming out of, uh, you know, all the different... So if you look at the last, the, uh, the last uh, uh, All Africa Festival that we did, uh, we had a lot of representations from all over, including Trinidad. So the Trinidadian government, didn't, they don't even have an embassy or consulate here in the UAE. But their Ministry of Culture heard about what we were doing and they sent us an email saying they would like so, to have some representation here. And they sponsored, fully sponsored about five acts. They played the five different bands that came in, sponsored their flights and everything else, got them here to come and perform. So it's for us, it's uh, telling a new story uh, and showing that we don't need to outpain each other mm -hmm. and everyone has got a story to tell and give it creating a platform mm -hmm. for people to see and we also one of the key things that we changed from the previous edition to this was we also changed the focus from just food so we in introduce arts yeah music music we have i and arts that was displayed in the 2021 edition one of them was worth over seven million dollars uh, another was sold for 1.5 and was sold during the was event. sold yeah that because uh we we, we built a uh a gala a, a pavilion specially dedicated to that yes that what was the name of uh, uh el natsu if i remember correctly he's based he's a Ghanaian but based in nigeria and he works with a lot of our recyclable uh natural sustenance uh products so uh, our partner, um, uh, our founding partner, uh, FEA Gallery, was bet out of the uh, first All Africa Festival. And from the name you can see, we said All Africa, not African. So that gave a platform that this was open to everyone and anyone that wanted to celebrate a part of Africa that was in them. So for me was, um, uh, let's crunch the numbers. The concept of focusing on African market is obviously Afrocentric. Uh, how, you know, profitable is that venture? I mean, Jamia has a lot of Africa, even though, of course, it's Middle Eastern Asia as well. Uh, All African Festival. Let's crunch the number. How viable is choosing to concentrate largely in you know, for Africans, by Africans. To be very clear on that, it's not sustainable. I'll be very, very clear on that. Uh, when we use the word African, unfortunately, it's a word that generalizes a very vast and diverse set of people and cultural uh, sectors, let me put it that way. Um, for us, and for me, for Jamia, the way I saw Jamia was in order for us to be able to bet something, we need to first learn how to crawl before we can, uh, how to sit before we can crawl, then walk and then start running. And one of the key things was um, to set up the marketplace to even see whether there was a viable market for it. 
Uh, obviously, there is, but as we begin to grow our numbers very quickly, we get saturated because uh, we reach a cap whereby we can grow any further unless we start bringing other different African market sectors into it, which we're doing. But the flip side to the entire equation, I didn't set out to only focus on Africa or Africans or people of African descent. I set out to show the best of our African products. There are a lot of products and produce that coming out of Africa, but they don't have that uh, exposure or viability to make it in the open market because most manufacturers, when they're manufacturing something in Africa, they want to spend as little as possible on their products, on their packaging. They spend more time on the product itself than the marketing of the products or the packaging of it the products, which is a bit cultural thing. I think we have a cultural mindset of let me not be loud, let me not, you know, let, let but let me make it good, but not in the market. We see that all kinds of packaging marketing as arrogance and pride and sure enough. Yes, as of now. Previously, it was because their market back in the day was limited to their geographical location. So they formed principles around that, that, okay, I'm selling to my people in this, but the more the world becomes a global village, the more the world becomes more that open. that becomes people from other... All that so the, demographics and yeah. other sectors. And they can eat your market uh, easy. Exactly. So there are quite a number of brands that have been able to break through this myth. And what they've done is they very quickly realized that, oh, we're doing coconuts. We can do coconut chips. Oh, the Filipinos love coconut chips. Oh, the Indians love coconut chips. Oh, the Mexicans love coconut chips. Okay, so when we are doing our coconut chips, if we only intend to sell to our little African brothers here, we're only going to be selling at best two pallets a month. But if we open up our packaging, because the general consensus with most African brands that are manufacturing, because of their geographical reach, they think, okay, if I'm only going to make you know, two pallets a month, and I'm only ser serving 5,000 people. Uh, I need to cut my costs down, my overall cost down, and rather than cutting the product, let me cut the packaging. My product is not going further than this space, so everyone knows what's in the package. So all I need is to put my logo on it. I slap my logo on it. I don't need to put any ingredients. I don't need to put vegan friendly or whatever on it and put the elf into the market. So a lot of people do that, but as they begin to grow, they forget that they are having new markets that they are penetrating into and they need to change the way they approach someone that's never seen plantain chips before. So if you sell it to a normal African, it's fine. But if you sell it to... So some of the manufacturers or small startups that I work with and I kind of mentor because they come to me and they say, oh, how can I get my markets into... How can I get my products into the UAE? How can I... I'm like, okay, first of all, you need to make sure that you have the necessary finances because there's a lot of regulatory bodies and things that you have to fulfill. Forget whatever you have in the country where you're coming from because you need to fulfill the health and safety standards here. Number two, the primary example I give them, I put, let's say, for instance, you're doing chips, right? Uh, be plantain chips, banana chips, coconut chips, whatever type of chips is it. I put... I put your product on the table and then I put the layers, the walkers, you know, the big boys. I said, okay, just imagine you, you don't know any of these brands and you walk into the room, you walk into a, a shop or a restaurant or wherever and they say, pick one. Would you pick your own product? And most times then their eyes, you know, opens up and they're like, wow, okay. Uh, but my people know what they're buying. I'm like, no, it's not about your people because your people don't make the numbers. Uh, one of the things I was telling someone your is the numbers. Someone I was talking to recently and I said, look, we as Africans or African descent need to change our total mindset on how we approach business. We have to. Because if you look at the Chinese, everywhere you go to, you see the Chinese restaurants. But 90% of the time, the Chinese restaurants, are they're not fighting over their Chinese Wow. The goal is not to, to get a, a Chinese man or woman to come and buy. It's to get people from other cultures. To come and try out, to come and try out a exactly. Chinese product. 
So the same yeah, thing happens crazy. with the Indian food. The yeah. same thing happens with the Italian food. Yeah. Right? Is you, you, you think restaurant? about exactly. Most times you go past the Chinese restaurants, you don't see Chinese people eating you in there. You don't. You see weird. other cultures. They but probably we Africans, food we want to have only our African people eating our African food. And sometimes I think it is a, it does us a disservice. And number two, it doesn't let us share with the world the amount of very organic produce, non-GMO products. But, but it's a mental issue. I, I, I think sometimes, for example, and sometimes it's a blind spot. I've run businesses where because you just try to, you know, add, of course, naturally, maybe your employees were Nigerians. And before you know it, the entire place is full of Nigerians. And before you know it, you've lost a lot of other non-Nigerian markets. And it was intentional. Sometimes the the staffing didn't even get conscious of how to intentionally make the environment conducive for non-Nigerians, how to adjust their their behavior to suit people from other cultures. You know, how do we begin to think this way? Because it's a habit, and this podcast is about habits of billionaires, whether you are one or not, how do you build the habits? And what I realized about billionaires is universality of their solution. They are thinking of solution for everybody, whether you're from their religion or their tribe, their culture, is a solution that every single person can consume. Well, unfortunately, we are thinking of just no solution for me, my people, and I. There's something that I've uh, consistently seen in the market space, uh, that the market never stays stagnant and it's constantly moving. There's never a perfect solution. You have to keep chasing perfection. Yeah. If you look at your market space the same way you looked at it last year, mm -hmm. there are so many parameters that has changed mm -hmm. from the things that happened last year mm -hmm. and the things that are happening this year. Mm -hmm. And so would it be next year. The key thing is to understand the key market indicators that one needs to watch out for because those are what dictates what the results is going to be. Mm -hmm. Rather than chasing a particular goal, it's best to chase and understand the way the market is evolving and be ahead of the curve, not behind the curve. Because once you're ahead of the curve, you can plan for... Be ahead of the curve and not behind it. Okay, guys, we've been a great time with team. A lot to care of, you know, CEO of Ojemia and co-founder of All African Festival. You know, we've been talking about billionaire habits among African cultures, African food, African sound, African everything. My last question would be, what are the habits you meeting billionaires and relating with wealthy people? What are the habits you've noticed that you intend to imbibe? At the end of the day, you can have the best ideas, you can have the best degrees, you can have the best everything. You can have the best coach. But I love the way you said it. Ideas don't pay the bills. Degrees don't pay the bills. Being smart. Being smart will not pay the bills. So the question is, what pays the bills? Execution. Come on, I like that. And execution, ruthless execution, starts with the most simplest things. Most human beings, we're all habitual human beings. Yeah. If everyone has got their strengths and weaknesses, a lot of people don't even understand themselves, not to, under not to say understanding other people. So first thing I always advise everyone, and most billionaires know this, by the way, they understand themselves. They know what their strengths are and they know what their weakness That's is. It. That's it. So first of all, if you don't understand yourself, you're, you're, you're not on the right path. <laughs> Let me put it that way. You've no missed more. it. You're still in denial. Exactly. So, and in order for one to be able to be uh, on the right track, yeah. every minute of every day, every second, should be very important to you. Yeah. You should be able to understand and process yourself in such a way that you know what you're doing. Simple example, I know each time I get home, I'm going into my bedroom, I take off my watch, I put it on charge because one of the smart watches, right? I take off my phone once I get my bedside, 
I have a particular charger dedicated to that. I charge it because I know the next morning I'm going to be having calls, running around the place, doing all of that. Be prepared for the next day. I sit down sometimes on my balcony, sometimes with a glass of wine, and I ask myself, okay, what did I do today? Go through my checklist and say, what didn't I complete? What needs to be done tomorrow? Make that list up. So when I sleep, I sleep completely because you need your sleep. And when I wake up, I'm ready for the move. And sometimes you wake up before you want to wake up. You wake up as a result of an emergency. Mm. Oh, boss, the air conditioning units in the warehouse too is just busted and all the goods are blah, blah, blah. And you have to jump out, you know, at 4 a.m. or at 6 a.m. So I already have a list of 10 things I want to do that day. But I start off the day completely on a totally different tangent and everything for that day. At four o'clock, I'm looking at my list and I'm laughing to myself like... <laughs> but what do you think billionaires will do in that situation that you probably have not started doing? The reason why they're billionaires is because they bring in the smartest and the most brilliant people around them. That's what makes them successful. And they do this right from day one even before they became billionaires. So from the proceeds, from the small financial proceeds that they make when they start off, they start looking for the best in the industry to help them take their business to the next level. And I'll give you a quick example, which uh, Steve Jobs brought in Philip Scozzi that was selling Coke, uh, uh, Pepsi, sorry, sugar water. <laughs> to sell technology. Yeah. So it doesn't Look, really matter was, where you are from. Yeah. So what most of I was this... able to convince the guy to stop working for a big Pepsi company and come for a company that you're not sure will work. Exactly. So one of the aspects that they have is they uh first they know themselves, they know their what. They believe in whatever they put their mind to. They make sure they convince themselves first and put their own mind into what they want to do. And then they move on to the next step, which is having convinced themselves and knowing what they want to do. Then they start the process of looking for the next level to take that business to because they understand that whichever space that you're working in, you're trading in, there's always a class above that space that you can go to. Yeah. And the idea is to look for similar or like-minded or intelligent people that can help you propel you to that to next, next level. level well we can continue and on and on but we have to stop uh, this uh, another episode of billionaire habits and it's been a wonderful time we love you see you next time bye bye thank you